family. For some of you, are like, Springer-esque, what's that mean? Jerry Springer show, kind of craziness. Some of you are, like, dating myself. Some of you younger people are like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I, I'm not sure of what's current in that vernacular, but, but you get it. It's, it. it's kind of a messy environment. And the reality is, is that I didn't have always great models to understand. And, and, the, and then what happens is you get older. Uh, God, God intersected my life when I was uh, 14 years old and radically changed my life. But he had to begin the process of building into me his character through his word. And I can tell you, it's been a process. But there's these moments that happen where you, you experience something and someone looks at you like, why are you doing that? Like, almost like what you're doing is weird. It's not normal, right? And they reveal that to you. And maybe they even show you in the word of God how it's problematic. And you're like, what? I didn't even know. And it's because of our experiences, of how we grew up, and sometimes the dysfunctions that we, we take on, and we don't even know they're dysfunctional. And sometimes having good relationships is hard because there's so many challenges with people. People aren't easy. They're challenging. They're difficult. They have personalities. <laughs> right? And we all have personalities, and, and, and it can get hard. And you have disagreements, and, and sometimes you get into these situations where maybe you even have, like you've had an offense. Somebody did something to you that offended you, and that offense has taken root in your heart, and the relationship has just gone sideways ever since. We, we get it. I mean, we all do. But here's the good news. Thankfully, God has shown us a path, and that path will lead to us having great relationships with people having great relationships with him. This is what God's word helps us with. When you don't have a path, when you don't know where to go or what to do, the good news is, is God's word paints you a picture. He draws you directions to get to wherever you want to go. And if you want to go to a place where you have good and healthy relationships, then I'm glad you're here. If you missed any of the weeks we've done so far, you can go back and find them online. You can look at those on our app, and, and you can find those teachings. But today, the last week of Good and Healthy, we're going to deal with something that I think is vital to us having good and healthy relationships, and that is that our relationships need to look like God. Like, they need to look like God. Like you're like, well, what does that mean? Well, we'll get to that in just a second. But how do my relationships actually end up looking like God? Now, do you guys remember this phrase? I, I don't know if you ever said this phrase, but I, I've, I've said this phrase, and I've, I've used it many times, and, and it's this. If it walks like a duck, and I guess talks like a duck, how's a duck talk? Oh, look at you. You guys are smart. So if it walks like a duck, which a duck kind of waddles, yes? And if it talks like a duck, quack, 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 it is a duck, right? I mean, that makes sense. It's logical. Makes sense. It, there's something about this feathered beast that the way it walks and the way it talks helps me to see that this is actually a duck. Now, I don't know who came up with duck. Well, I guess the Bible says Adam did. You know, he's like got the name, all the creatures. So he was like, he looked at it and he said duck. But, but, but again, it's, it's, he walks like a duck, he talks like a duck, it must be a duck, yes? So there's logic to it, it makes sense. It, it, it all kind of supports what you're seeing. Now, if you saw something walking and talking not like a duck, but maybe like walking and talking like a camel, you wouldn't necessarily call it a duck. You'd call it a camel. So, so we get it, that makes sense to us. We're smart people, very, very simple. So here's what I want to talk about for a few minutes. God is the same way. <laughs> Let me say it this way. If it walks like God, if it talks like God, then it's God. Now, I know that for some of you in the room, you're like, I don't know what that means. Because like, how are you defining God? What is God and how is God and who's God and is God the tree and not the tree and up, down. He's a metaphor, not a metaphor. He's just, what is he? Good news. As believers in Jesus Christ... We have a book, and that book called the Bible, which is the, the most famous book ever written, 
always on the top bestsellers. Number one, New York Times sold more copies than Stephen King. We have a book. And the book tells us what it is. And the book tells us how God walks. And God talks. So that we can know what God looks like. And then the Bible encourages all of us to live in such a way that we look like that. Makes sense. And so what's, what's, what, what I'm trying to drill down on is that God has characteristics that are very clearly laid out in the scriptures. And, he, and I'm going to run through these real quick. We don't have time for that. I'm going to give you 15 characteristics of God. You're like, what? Don't try to write these down, please. And because and, 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 you'll just you'll get a cramp. And I don't want you to get a cramp. All right. I don't want you to get a cramp. Um, but but but. The, the Bible is very clear about some of these. And so here's, here's what we know about God. We're told in the scripture that God is infinite. He's immutable. Some of you are like, I don't know what that means. That's okay. Self-sufficient. He's omnipotent. You're like, oh, here are the omnis, right? Omnipotent. Omniscient. Omnipresent. These are all like a lot of omnis. Wise, faithful, he's good, he's just, he's merciful, he's gracious, he's loving, and wait for it, he's holy. See, these are 15 characteristics of God, attributes of God, characteristics of God. This is important because this goes to help you see that this is who God is. The attributes of God help us to see and understand who God is. See, these attributes are, truthfully, some of them are unattainable for us. Like, I'm never going to be omniscient, even though sometimes I act like it. Like, I'm all-knowing. I don't know if you ever act that way. Maybe you have someone next to you that acts that way. But the truth is, I'm not all-knowing. And, and the other thing is, I'm never going to be omnipresent. Like, I'm present right here. I can't be present out there because I'm right here. But God is above space and time and can be present here and also there. So, so, so get this. These are things that you and I will never be able to do. But there are characteristics of God that we can see come to our lives. Like, for example, we can become wiser. Right? I mean, that's possible. How do you do that? Know his word. Spend some time in his word over a period of time. Eventually, when you get some gray hair, you'll have word and wisdom. It's a scary thing when you have uh, white hair and no wisdom. Believe me, I've met them. Because age doesn't mean that you have experienced a maturation that leads to wisdom. So that's important you know that. But, but, but the Bible can give you that. So wisdom or, or goodness or faithfulness or mercy, these are things that I can practice in my life. These are things that can be uh, exhibited in the choices that I make. So in your relationships, the people you hang out with, these kinds of characteristics can actually be present. I would be scared of somebody that believes they're omnipresent. Right? I mean, I'd be scared of that person. But at the same time, we know that this, they are characteristics that humans can become wiser. They can become more faithful. They can become gooder. <laughs> I make up words. So is it possible? Yes. It's possible to become better in these areas. Now, it's not easy, is it? No, because I usually want to do what I want to do. And, and, and if I want to do what I want to do, then oftentimes if it's not brought to the word of God and, and governed by the word of God and I'm submissive to the word of God, I can do things that aren't necessarily godly. Here's the truth. None of us are perfect. Matter of fact, nobody in here is a perfect. Matter of fact, we created a church for no perfect people. And so don't get mad if the church screws up because the church is led by imperfect people. So when you hold a preacher or somebody else to a standard that they can't ever attain, come on. They'll never be able to be perfect. And as good as I am. 
I'll never be perfect. I'll always make mistakes. And part of being in relationship with one another is learning this reality that perfection isn't really the goal. That's why some of you struggle so much in your life, that you're committed to a goal that you can't achieve. It's called perfectionism. Now, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't work to be accurate. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't work to make sure you're doing your best with what you have. But the idea that somehow you can achieve perfection is part of the problem because you're never going to be able to do that. Now, but here's the coolest part of Jesus. I, well, there's many cool parts. But this is a really cool piece of having a relationship with Jesus. Is that even though I can't achieve perfection, somehow God has worked it out that if I have a relationship with Jesus and I receive that into my life, that somehow his perfection, his perfect righteousness comes to me. Now, does that mean that I always have right action? No. It means that my standing, my identity is one of perfection before a perfect God because of what Jesus has done on my behalf. Not because of anything I've done, but because of what I've received through Jesus. Now, that's important because the Bible says that we serve a God that clearly says to the world, I am holy and I am looking for a holy people. So how do you become holy? Well, you got to get Jesus. If you're trying to get holy without Jesus, good luck. You will fail. That's why we need Jesus. So Jesus comes and says to us that if you will receive him as your Savior, as your Lord, you will receive a righteousness that isn't it doesn't have anything to do with what you do. Matter of fact, let me read it to you. Listen to this. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for God made Christ who never sinned, right? You knew that. Maybe you knew that. Maybe you've heard that on the TV somewhere. Jesus was sinless. It's important. So for God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering of for our sin. Then he goes on to say this. I love this. For that we could be made what? right with God that we could be made right with God so so today here's the good news that if you don't know Christ today or if you do know Christ you can be made right you are right with God not because of anything you did but simply you accepted a gift that was sitting on a table and you reached out and you grabbed it by faith trusting that it was true and what happens is that you now stand before God. Get this, get it. Perfect. Righteous because of Jesus. Now, let me ask you this. That seems like a pretty good place to start. Like if that's your standing, if that's literally your identity, if you are uh, characterized as a son or daughter of the most high God, then that means that your identity is pretty good. Like your standing is pretty good. So when you think about achieving something greater than you're currently experiencing, like becoming wiser or more gracious or more loving, you know that you have something in you now that can help you get there. Not your own effort, but the very presence of God. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit comes into your life when you receive Jesus in that way, when you receive this righteousness, become right before God, the Holy Spirit now comes to your life, and here's the best part, is the Holy Spirit absolutely empowers you to achieve greater expressions of wisdom and holiness. But it's the Spirit of God that empowers you, enables you to do it. I love this. Because what it does is like, you know, all your effort, and I know we all have effort, and some of us feel like we have to do more than others, but the good news is, is that when I learn to abide more in God's presence, and when I learn to study and love his word, what happens is that the power I need is there. I don't have to do a bunch of push-ups to get it. It's already there. I can act out of it in my life. And so I don't know if you experience that right now in your daily life. Maybe you're overwhelmed right now. Maybe you, you're not experiencing it. Maybe you would say yourself to yourself, I'm not wise today. I, have not, I haven't been wise for a year. 
if you ask the person next to you that you really, you know, have a oogly googlies for. If you ask them, do you think I'm gracious? Do you think I'm merciful? Do you think I'm loving? It'd be interesting to hear what they said, huh? Let's take a test, all right? So this couple here. No, I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Like, let's say, stand up. Okay, stand up. You know, we're not going to do that. that. Some of you are like, oh, God. Is he going to do it? No. So my son, some of you know my son, Caleb. I've had people say this about my son to me, okay? Especially when, like, if you don't know, he's a little preacher boy, right? He's a little preacher man. And so when he gets up on the stage to preach, he preaches the way he knows how to preach right now. Yes? He just, he does his part. I've had people say to me when he gets done preaching, man, he sounds a lot like you. Like, and they sometimes say he looks like you even. Now, we'll figure that out. Biologically, that makes sense, right? I mean, it makes sense. He always, I love my son, because he'll always say to people, like they say, you look like your father or something, or you're a good-looking kid. He says, well, I'm not as good-looking as my daddy. (laughs) Some of you, you wish you had that. Come to the parenting series, you'll get it. (laughs) Come to the parenting series. (laughs) Glory to God. But the point I'm making is that he looks and acts like his dad. And the reason he looks and acts like his dad is he spends a lot of time with his dad. Now, for some of us, that's bad news. <laughs> right? I mean, come on. Have you ever had that moment where your kid does something you did and you're like, oh, my God. <laughs> Where'd you learn that word? <laughs> you, daddy. <laughs> Friends, that's scary, right? That's very, I mean, it's scary. So, so, so my son looks like me. He acts like me. And the reason that is, is he spends time with me. Your relationships will be good and healthy. Your relationships will look like God when you spend time with God. When you spend time in his word. And these are the things that can help us have great relationships. And so for, for the remainder of our time, I want to zero in on two attributes of God that I think need to be present in our relationships Number one is wisdom. And number two is holiness. Now, you've probably been to church uh, several times in your life, and you may have never even heard a sermon on holiness. It's not a real popular topic nowadays. You know, most people just want to know about victory. You know, most people want to just know about things that are very practical for their lives. Well, holiness is very practical for your life. You just got to know how to apply it. So, so, so I want to spend a little time talking about wisdom and holiness and how this can help us in our relationships. Because, see, we are instructed to be more like God. And one of the things we know about God is that he's wise and he's holy. So God is infinitely wise, consistently wise, and perfectly wise. Those are great words. But it helps you to see that there's nothing lacking in his wisdom okay that's good news now if you're wondering more about these attributes of god there's a great book written by aw tozer called the attributes of god so pick it up read it it's great it's deep so don't think you're like it's not the reader's digest all right like you're gonna have to dig in uh, because tozer requires you to think and so I would just encourage you to pick that up if you're interested in some of this. But, but just for our time today, I want to just tease out a few thoughts on wisdom. Listen to this. This is the definition that I want us to look at. Wisdom, among other things, get this first part, is the ability to devise perfect ends and to achieve those ends by the most perfect means. That doesn't seem easy to do. He goes on to say, it sees the end from the beginning so that there can be no need to guess or conjecture. So no guessing. Wisdom sees everything in focus. Wouldn't you love to just be able to see everything in focus? Each in proper relationship to all, how they all fit together, and is thus able to work towards, get this, predestined goals 
with flawless precision. Now, you read that, and you're like, well, I definitely don't have wisdom, <laughs> right? Like, that's, I mean, that's a, that's a hard thing to get, but here's the thing we know, is that God is wise, and you're in God, and so if God's wise, and you're in God, therefore, you with me? Therefore, the effect here, listen to it, our relationships should and can reflect the wisdom of God. Because we have access to the source of wisdom. And if we have access to the source of wisdom, then that means that that wisdom can flow out of us into the relationships we currently have. But here's what I know. We say we want it, but we don't really want it. Do you know what I mean? Like, let me describe that a little more. We don't want wisdom. We want what we want. You know what I'm talking about? Any of you all have any of that in you? We don't want wisdom, really. We say we want wisdom. Like, it's, a, it's an ideal that we ascend to, but we don't necessarily operate out of. And so we say we want wisdom in an idea, a pie in the sky, an ideal. Yes, wisdom. Ooh, yummy, yummy. Give me summy. But that ideal never comes to my heart in a transformative way that I then operate out of. You see? Because the truth is, is we just want what we want. That's, I mean, that's just the reality. We want, we want, I want that. I want that. God, no. God says, no. I don't care. God says, don't do it. I don't care. I'm going to do what I want. Can you relate? I don't know. I don't know if you can relate to this. Thus, listen, thus, we are unable to, listen, back to wisdom. We're unable to have the ability to devise a perfect end, to achieve those ends by the most perfect of means when we choose to say no. Now, if we say yes, the Bible says that we can have wisdom and that we can operate out of that kind of perfect wisdom. I don't know. That sounds good to me. Listen to this in Proverbs 4. Proverbs 4, stay with me. Proverbs 4, 5 through 7. Listen, get wisdom. Like, very clear, get wisdom. Whatever you do, get wisdom. Matter of fact, the Bible would say, trade everything you have for wisdom. Gold, silver, it's more precious. Because wisdom will help you make good choices. Wisdom will help you make good decisions. Wisdom will keep you on the path of God and not on some other path. So you see, wisdom's important. So get wisdom. Develop good judgment, the Bible says. Don't forget my words and turn away from them. Don't turn your back on wisdom, for she will what? Protect you. Protect you. And then it says, love her, and she will what? Guard you. Man, I need some protection in my life, some guarding in my life. Verse 7, getting wisdom is the wisest thing you can do. Isn't that good? Thank you, Captain Obvious. <laughs> wisdom is the wisest thing you can do. And then watch this. And whatever else you do, develop good judgment. Good judgment. Around all things. But, but more specifically, for, for our context today, around relationships. That we'd have wisdom. Wisdom. That, 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 we, that we would have good decision making, good judgment when it comes to the relationships that we engage. And can I just be honest with you? As a preacher, I've been doing this a long time, pastoring people for a long time. The places where people have screwed up their life more than anything has been in the relationships that they keep. And friends, I'm just telling you, that's real. That's real. And so, 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 so we have to have wisdom when it comes to our relationships because the Bible says that if we have wisdom, the wisdom of God, it teaches us to make good decisions about the types of people that we should allow in our lives. If you're a parent, the best thing you can do is help your kid get wisdom because if you help your kid get wisdom, then they can make good choices. And if they can make good choices, then they're going to be all right, friend. They're going to be all right. 
See, the wisdom of God, I love this, will protect and guard us from evil or foolish people. Some of you have hitched your wagon to some foolish people. You say, Pastor, how do you know they're foolish? Well, the Bible describes foolish people. Here, let me, let me give you a definition of foolish people. Foolish people are, are the people that hear the truth and don't do anything with it. That's how the Bible describes foolish. Wise people are people that hear the word of God and they do something with it. They activate it in their life. And then, then the other category that Proverbs teaches us is that there's evil people too. And evil people are different than foolish people. And they're definitely different than wise people. So, so, so if you have an evil person in your life, I just tell you, you better run. If you have a foolish person in your, your life, you might be able to help them by saying, this is the word of God and you keep denying it. Now, can you get better? But that, that doesn't always take. Some people are like, no, I don't care what you say. This is what I'm going to do. I don't care what the word of God says. Blah, 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 blah. Fine. But the principle of the path applies. You want to be foolish? Fine. But you will find yourself on a path that leads to your own destruction, not to your life. Whether you like it or not. You're like, is that real? Yeah, it's real. And some of, us, some of us are fading right now. We're starting to drift off of the path because we've not disciplined ourselves to adhere to what the Word of God tells us. Man, Pastor, that's good. That's good. <laughs> You've heard me say this. Show me your friends, I'll show you your future. The people you hit your wagon to, I believe me, teenagers in the room, Adults in the room, you look at your spheres of influence, you look at your circles, and you'll start to understand real quick why things are going the way they are. You know what I've seen? I've seen this so many times, especially in dating relationships, is that somebody thinks to themselves, you know, if I work really hard, I'm going to help this person become more of what God wants. Like, what we do is we do the, I call it the lowest common denominator dating. Like you meet somebody and they're at the lowest common denominator. Like what that means is like, I'm spiritual. What does that mean? But you know, so you start there and like, well, dad, mom, they're spiritual. And I can help them. Now, some of you are like, I did that and it worked. I know, I know. It's an anomaly. Evangelism dating is not a good strategy. Now, if you achieved it, well done. Well done. Proud of you. But I just want you to know that is not how it usually goes. Because you know what I've found in my own life? And I'm not just picking on other people. I've found this in my own life. The people that are living less than and committed to living less than God's best, they ultimately bring me down. I think I'm going to bring them up. But it doesn't work, I'm telling you. I've seen it so many times. And so I'm just asking you to be wise in your relationships. You want good and healthy relationships? Then be wise because wisdom teaches us how to live. It teaches us how to live. And when we can live and make good decisions, friends, we can surround ourselves with people that are going to help us get to the place that we want to go, which is, right, to be more like God to reflect the character and nature of God in the relationships that we have. All right, last thing here, number two, is that wisdom, or that God is also, not just wise, but God is also holy. Now, I know sometimes when you hear that, it's hard to kind of get your brain around what that means for you. But listen, God is holy. We are in God. Therefore, you with me? Therefore, our relationships should reflect the holiness of God. You're like, Pastor, is that a big deal? Absolutely big deal. What does that mean? What does it mean to be holy? Just simply, holiness means to be set apart. It means to be set apart. Or, or let me say it this way, pure. How, how about this? Uncommon. That it's not common. It's, it, it's not the wooden bowl. It's the fine china. Okay, it's, it, it, it's uncommon. Or this is one that's really been helping me lately is it's morally healthy. Think about that. What does it mean to be healthy, right? It's like, you, you know what that means. Like, I gotta eat and exercise and do all the things, right? So apparently that's what makes us healthy. So when it comes to morality, 
when it comes to living in a certain way, a standard, that I'm healthy in my morals is what it means to be holy. That's good. Because especially in a world where the moral thing is like a sliding scale, well, whatever you want it to be. What a scary place to live. What a scary thought to, to be in a relationship with someone that's morality is, is on a sliding scale. Situational even. Whew, that's scary. So, so, so our relationship should reflect the holiness of God and we should surround ourselves with people that are committed to that kind of standard. Right? So, so once again, A.W. Tozer gives us a great definition of this. So let me read it to you. And this is a big one. Everybody okay? Get, slap your face a little bit. Put some water on it. Do whatever you got to do, but you tune into this. Okay? This is, a, this is how he describes holiness. Listen to this. Since God's first concern for his universe is, look at this, is its moral healthy. But that his first concern for his universe is its moral healthiness. That is, its holiness. Do you see how he compares holiness and moral health? Then watch this. Whatever is contrary to this is necessarily under his eternal displeasure. Like, in other words, he doesn't like it. He is not pleased with whatever that is. Okay, you're like, God is? Yeah, God. It's true. Goes on. To preserve his creation, God must destroy whatever would destroy it. Think of cancer. What if you mess around with cancer? Right? If you don't get it all. It, it eventually spreads. So use that as an idea for your thoughts when it comes to holiness. So, so, so he says that anything, that anything that's contrary to moral health, it says that it displeases God. Look at this. To preserve his creation, God must destroy whatever, whatever would destroy it. He goes on to say this. When he arises to put down iniquity and save the world from irreparable moral collapse, guy's good with words isn't he it is said that he is angry angry so you're like i don't like this i don't like thinking of god as being angry i like god being soft and cuddly and cute right full of grace and love and, and all these things yes 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 me too but i can't just simply deny that this is a part of God's plan too. This is a part of who God is. And what I mean is, is, yes, he's loving, he's gracious, he's merciful, he's all of those things. But he's also holy. And if he's holy, then that means he's just. And if he's just, that means he makes things right. In the face of all kinds of non-rightness in our world. So he goes on to write this. So it's said that he's angry. Watch this. Every wrathful judgment in the history of the world has been a holy act of preservation. That God is preserving his creation from an infection that is creating displeasure and perversion. And then watch this. The holiness of God, the wrath of God, and the health of the creation are inseparably united. Then watch this. God's wrath is his utter intolerance of whatever degrades and destroys. And everybody says, wow. Yeah. Some of you are like, oh, no. When our relationships aren't right, holy, morally healthy, listen to me. The Bible would tell us that they eventually will collapse. That they will not stand the test of time because of what is infecting them. Okay, now, everybody take a breath. You need to know this. We serve a holy God who's looking for a holy people. We've established that because of Jesus, we can all be holy. 
That's, that's, that's where we're at. If you want that, you can be that. Then as you become holy, you can then live out of that holiness in the world. Not meaning that you'll be perfect, but absolutely meaning that it's possible for you to become wiser. It's possible for you to become better. It's possible for you to start to reflect the character and nature of God. Do you see where I'm getting? You see the logic to where we get to this place. And so the Bible is so clear that the wisdom of God and the holiness of God really does matter in terms of helping us create a morally healthy uh, atmosphere, environment. Because if I said to you, don't you want a morally healthy family? Don't you want a morally healthy church? Don't you want a morally healthy preacher? Don't you want a morally healthy, right? Like, we get that. That's what we want. But we also have to recognize that we don't just get it. We actually have to do something about it. And part of what we have to do about it is be so committed to the things God's committed to. In other words, that we go after the infections and that we don't allow them in our lives, that we're committed at such a deep level to say no. That is outside of God's plan, God's word, and therefore I'm not going to participate in it or be a part of it, period. Because here's what I'm saying to you guys. You will not get God's best by doing it your way. And many of us want to define what's real and true and right. And I'm just, I, I just want to say, quite frankly to you, good luck. Because I can tell you this, I don't trust a human's opinion whatsoever when it comes to what God is up to. I look to the Word of God to tell me what God is up to. And then when the Word of God tells me what God is up to, then it's my job to make sure I do it. To rightly understand it and then move out from that point of view. And be so committed to the wisdom and the holiness of God that that is how my life is marked. So we need morally healthy relationships too, don't we? If we're going to have long-term relationships that are really strong and powerful, then friends, we've got to reject any ignorance that we have. Because all of us today, whether you like it or not, you just entered into something that you can't deny anymore. You are no longer ignorant to what the Word of God says about wisdom and holiness in regards to our relationships. So you cannot deny that that's true. So I invite you to do the next right thing. Whatever God tells you to do, you do it. Because see, the Bible says if we want to see good relationships, well, then we have to be people of love, sacrificial love. We have to be people of humility. We have to be people of kindness. We have to be people who keep no record of wrong. We got to be people who are absolutely committed to the truth. Uh, we got to be people that, that no matter what, man, we fight. We stay in it. We get wisdom. We don't quit. When we make a covenant with someone, we stay just like God stays. We're, we are in, man, because that is what it means to have good and healthy relationships. So, friends, absolutely. Thank you, Jesus. Some of you are, yeah. Some of you are still wrapped up on holiness right now, and you're like, I, I can't get past the thing about God being angry. Stay with me. Let me speak to that. And I mean this. For some of you that are afraid of God, that the, the, the anger part gets you. Listen, anger is not an attribute of God. You notice it wasn't in the list. His wrath is not his attribute. His wrath or anger is a surgical strike against sin that harms his creation or his people. And God will strike at times. Matter of fact, the Bible says that how long, O oh Lord, will you relent in the face of this kind of iniquity? See, God will act at some point. I'm not in control of that. But the good news is, is it's temporary. As he sets creation right with his action, he goes back to being loving, kind attributes. Because it's an action of his, it's not his personhood. Get that. That's important. Because some of you grew up with an angry God. And let me just tell you, God is not angry at you. And God is not angry. And that is not his countenance. God is a loving God. And so sometimes he gets angry just like we do when we see sin. Have you ever had somebody close to you that was affected by sin at such a deep level that it pained you? That it made you angry? That just means you're normal. Because sin should make us angry. Now, we shouldn't sin in our anger, but it absolutely should make us angry. And then we bring that to God and see what he wants to do with it. 
Okay, I'm going to end here. Some of you are like, thank God. <laughs> how, do we, how do we do this? Like, it, it, let me read this to you in Deuteronomy 30. Today I give you the choice between life and death, between blessing and curses. So, so God is giving us a choice today. He says, now I call all heaven and earth to witness to that choice that you're going to make. Oh, that you would, listen to this. Moses is saying this to us. He's saying, oh, that you would choose life. That you would choose the right path. That you would choose wisdom. That you would choose God. That your descendants might live. Oh, God, guys, can I tell you how much that is my prayer? That for everything that was stolen from me when I was younger, because of horrible decisions that were made by people that I didn't have control over, that God says that if I'll choose life, that not only will he bless me, but he'll bless my descendants. And so as a father, as a pastor, guys, I pray that you would choose life, that not only for this life, but for the ones that are coming behind you, that there would be a generation of people that experience the power of God in their lives. Come on. What a, what a beautiful, and then he says this. He says, you can make this choice by loving the Lord your God, obeying him, and committing yourself firmly to him. And then look at this. This is the key to your life. Some of you are like, the key? Yeah, that means it opens the door. This opens the door for life in your life. If you will simply choose the right thing here. And so as we end, how do we choose life? Let me give it to you straight. It's my favorite way to do it anyway. <laughs> is don't get yoked to death. Now you say, what does that mean? In other words, don't be yoked. Don't put a apparatus on you that hitches your wagon to death. Whether death is coming to you in a, in a person or a choice or a decision, that you would never yoke yourself with anything other than God and the things of God. And you would be really careful never to do that. For, for some of you, you've probably heard this, but in 2 Corinthians 6, right? 14 through, 14 through 18, but, but let's just go with 14. Do not be what? Unequally yoked together with what? Unbelievers. Unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness and what communion has light with darkness? <laughs> See, we shouldn't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. And I just want to say to you, if you're a dating person in the room, please hear me. Please hear me. Just don't do it. You say, Pastor, why not? I'll tell you why. Because I spend some of my day on a regular basis trying to help people that have done that. And some of you are in this room today and you're in a relationship where you come to church alone and it's terribly painful because you're yoked with someone that doesn't believe. And I want to say first and foremost for somebody in the room that has that experience, I love you and I am going to pray with you that that person would come to faith because I know how terribly painful that is. But also for everybody else in the room, be warned that we would not live in that kind of way because God clearly tells us don't yoke ourselves to things that aren't of God. I think I'm going to end there. Let's pray together. God, in the, in the stillness of this moment, oh, 
Oh, God. Your word has tenderized this room like a cutlet, just tenderized. And right now, some of us in this room are exposed. And we feel the pain. And it hurts because we are living in this kind of world that there's this division. There's a, there's a yoking that's occurred that's causing real pain. I just want to pray for you. Jesus, for anybody here that is experiencing that challenge of being in relationship, even covenantal relationship that, that's opposite of your word. God, I pray right now in the name of Jesus for the spirit of the Lord to come. God, I pray for the comfort of Jesus. Your word says that, that you are a God who draws close to the brokenhearted. And I pray right now, God, would you draw close to anybody here that's experiencing that kind of pain? Spirit of the living God, will you fall afresh on your people? Lord, I don't know what will happen, but I know that as long as there's still time, your word tells us that you can do a miracle. And so, Father, I pray for anybody here today that needs a miracle in their relationship, that needs a miracle in their marriage. God, I pray in the name of Jesus for the power of God to come and the miracle would happen. And Father, for the person that is in this place, God, I pray that you would give them perseverance in the midst of their suffering. I pray that they would be vigilant in their prayer, that we might see life change come simply because this person chooses to live your way and that the unbeliever would be drawn to them because of the simple fact that their life reflects the character and nature of God to them. No judgment. The Bible says, come to me. Come to me. For the person in the room today that, that maybe doesn't have a relationship with Jesus, I just want to pray for you. You know, earlier we were talking about just how do you have good relationships? Well, one of them is get into a group. That's one step you can take right now. For anybody right now, God, that, that is, that, that's scared of that, they don't want to do it. God, I pray in Jesus' name that you'd give them the power and the strength to check that box and that you would create some divine predestined relationships that would lead to their uh, that would lead to them finding these relationships, Jesus. And for the person to hear today that wants the relationship that matters most with you, Jesus Christ, King of the world, Savior. The Bible says if you'll confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is who he says he is, and he's done what he says he's done, that, that if you would take hold of that gift, that you would be saved. And so right now, I want to pray for anybody that wants that in their life. I'm going to pray a prayer. I'd love for you to repeat this after me. So church, let's all pray this together. But you're, if you're here today and this is your prayer, your heart, then pray this prayer as well. Heavenly Father, I need a Savior. Would you forgive me of my sins? Would you forgive me of my rebellion? God, burn up anything that's not pleasing to you. You're my refiner's fire. I surrender my life to you. You be my Lord, please. Change me from the inside out. Show me my purpose. I choose to follow you the rest of my days. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, can we celebrate anybody that's making a decision? God, I'm so proud of you. Amen. Amen. Come on. Well, hey, I want to invite you to stand. And what we're going to do in these last few minutes together is we're going to spend just a few minutes just loving and praying and pleasing God with our worship. And if, you're, if your heart right now is really tender because of the Word of God, express that to Him. Because, see, the Bible says that when we have a contrite heart, oh, it draws God. When our heart is broken before the Lord or our heart is rend in such a way that it, that, it, that it makes us lean in to God, oh, He shows up. And so as we sing this last song, let's lean in. If you're tender before the Lord, just begin to worship Him. And I believe right now you will experience a special touch from God right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, let's worship Him.